Hello, I'm Dominic Journey and I am the Director General of the Zoological Society of London, a global wildlife and biodiversity charity with London Zoo and Whipsnade Zoo as part of who we are, alongside a research institute into wildlife health and uh, a conservation NGO working on boots on the ground conservation in the UK and in Asia and Africa. I'm delighted to be contributing to the Khan Perspectives series and my first thoughts are about my life. How did I get to where I am and who I am today? Well, it's been a long journey and I probably began when I was a little boy in short uh, trousers with scuffed knees going to London Zoo and being taken there by my parents as part of the beginning of my understanding of the natural world and of wildlife, biodiversity, and how we as people um, engage with that natural world. Fast forward a few years, and when I was coming up to leave school, I saw an advertisement for a learning language scholarship. And I applied for this advertisement, um, and I got the scholarship. And that took me off to South America, to Latin America, before going off to university. And from that uh, came two things. One was an absolute love of learning languages and of engaging with people whose cultures were different from my own. And the second was a real question about how we as humanity and as different societies are engaging with and treating nature. I saw some extraordinary things uh, there, um, both uh, marvels of the natural world, including the Amazon rainforest. I also saw how we had scoured um, with, for example, some of our copper mines, um, the natural world and how we'd had an enormous impact that just made me question um, whether we were getting our balance right. From those experiences, when I left university, I wanted to change the world and I wanted to do it one species at a time or one peoples at a time. And so I signed up after a brief stint um, working in finance as a diplomat. And that's where I spent most of my professional career before joining the Zoological Society of London. Most recently, I was British ambassador in the Gulf, in the United Arab Emirates, and then in Afghanistan. And I first started going to Afghanistan in the late 1990s when the Taliban had just taken Kabul. That was an incredibly grim time to get to know a country and its people. Um, there had been a bitter civil war going on for many years, and I was working in support of a UN peace process that ultimately did not succeed. I was the single Western diplomat based in Afghanistan. Incredible now when you think about um, the United Kingdom has one of its largest embassies in Afghanistan. The United States has its largest embassy there. Um, but in those days, there was just me from the OECD, from the Western European and North American countries based in Afghanistan. And that was a time where um, people uh, were unable to go to school, no children in school. Uh, women were unable to walk on the streets. Um, and killings continued through the civil war at a very, very high rate. It was a ghastly time to see a country to get to know its people um, and also to see the impact um, on the landscape of desperately poor people uh, chopping down trees for firewood, desperately poor people um, killing anything that they could eat um, because they were starving. Now, when I was most recently in Afghanistan as British ambassador, it still remains a very troubled place, but goodness, some things have improved massively for the better. There is now education. Universities are open. I met many very capable women in senior positions. And yes, fighting does continue in many areas. And yes, it is far from being a peaceful or stable society, but it is a country, it is a society where there is so much more hope than there was 20 years ago when I first started to get to know Afghanistan. And so for me, that is a terrific example of how 
despite many wrong decisions along the way and many things that um, Afghans and the international community would regret, um, there has been progress and it has been possible to shape things for the better at a time when, when I was booted out of Afghanistan by the Taliban in 1998, that seemed completely impossible. And so heading up a conservation charity, I take the same spirit of optimism now. We know that the balance between humanity and nature is not right. We see that in our impact on climate change um, and how that is affecting people. We see that with COVID-19, um, which ultimately seems to have come from a zoonotic disease, a disease passed on by wildlife, by animals to people, um, and is probably tracing its roots back into the illegal wildlife trade. These seem like absolutely insuperable challenges to humanity at the moment. But I believe, and it's the belief that fires me and everybody in my organisation, that actually it is possible to tackle these sorts of challenges, just as it seemed absolutely impossible 20 odd years ago that women should ever be working again in Afghanistan or that girls and children should ever be back at school. Um, I believe it is possible to make that seismic change in the relationship between humanity um, and nature. And perhaps COVID-19 and the terrible experience of the pandemic is a catalyst for us to rethink that relationship and to take some action to do something about it. What do I care about? Well, I care about the world, the world I live in, and the world that I'm passing on to my children and to the next generation. I care about it, and I am concerned about it, because I know something is not right. As a professional diplomat through my career, I've wanted to see how I could engage in particular in some of the conflict resolution in areas that are most troubled around the world. Now heading the Zoological Society of London and being very closely engaged um, in how we um, as ZSL influence the nearly two million people coming through our zoos and influence the hundreds of people whom we educate on PhDs and master's courses uh, about wildlife health and biodiversity. As I think about the way in which we try to get messages out about the risk to biodiversity in our world, I see that as an equal challenge, maybe even a greater challenge to that challenge of, as a diplomat, looking for peace negotiations and how to resolve conflict. The reason why I know that we are incredibly challenged as a race, as humanity, um, is because of the evidence. ZSL produces something called the Living Planet Index. It's worth taking a look at. Have a look on Google. It is essentially an index, if you like, it's the FTSE 100 of um, what is happening to biodiversity across the planet. It's really well evidenced. It's based on literally thousands, tens of thousands of data sets around the world over time. And it shows that since 1970, there has been an incredible 57, 58% loss of biodiversity across the world. Now, what does that mean? Well, if that were human populations, that would be Europe, Africa, and the Americas all wiped out. And so that is what's happened to the abundance of wildlife across the world in the last 45, nearly 50 years. An incredible diminution, an incredible impoverishing of biodiversity across the world. And that really troubles me and it should trouble you. The main causes of that are three and they all have a common link. They are human caused climate change, human caused land use change, think cutting down the Amazon 
or um, palm oil forests replacing tropical jungle and they are the human exploitation of wildlife think in particular the illegal wildlife trade and so it's people like you and I who are the main drivers of that massive extinction of species and a reduction in wildlife populations across the world and that is not sustainable and that causes me really great concern and for me personally is the spur to action it's the spur for me to as the leader of zsl see how our zoos can contribute to changing and informing opinions in the united kingdom opinions of people who come through as school kids we have 150,000 children doing curriculum based education with us every year as parents, as voters, as consumers going down to the supermarket and thinking a little more deeply about what it is that they're buying, as people who are um, shareholders in businesses. And I don't think that the environment, I don't think that conservation can be a specialist sport. This is not something that only a very small fraction of the population can and should engage in. This is something that should be visceral for all of us. And that's why I passionately believe that it is right for an NGO like ours to be engaging very directly with businesses, um, with investment management organisations, with governments to have a dialogue about policy, to have a dialogue about the impact for good or for ill that any institution can have on wildlife and on biodiversity. This is something that we, as our societies, we as networks of concerned and engaged people, we as businesses working together as we think about the fundamentals of our economy and the impact that we have as businesses, as organizations, as governments, this is something that we have to tackle together. Divided we fall, but united we can actually have a really positive impact um, together for the better. And that's what drives me and makes me want to get up in the morning and to change the world, ideally one species at a time. Reflecting for a moment of the impact of COVID-19, this is primarily a people tragedy. It is a pandemic that will have a massive impact across the globe on our societies, on our economy, on individual businesses. ZSL, with our zoos closed, which is our main source of income, has been terribly affected uh, by COVID-19. We risk going out of business and being unable to open our zoos and also unable to continue with our wildlife health research our science and with our conservation around the world all of these are enormously important significant consequences from covid19 it is though at its heart a people tragedy and if you or somebody you love has been really badly affected by this disease then you know all about it from a very very personal perspective and that is what mounts up to have that societal impact. So as I think about it uh, as something that impacts my organization, the organization I lead and the society that I live in, I'm very conscious that behind those uh, larger perspectives, there are so many individual stories, um, both of heroism, um, our care workers um, in the UK, the NHS, and others who have been just incredible during this lockdown period, um, but also of enormous grief and tragedy. For us and for me, I'm very conscious of COVID-19 having its roots in zoonotic disease. These are diseases that exist in wildlife populations and can move into the human population. As the Zoological Society of London we have a particular expertise in wildlife health 
and in the management of zoonotic disease in wildlife populations. We've been working on the research to stop Ebola in West Africa moving from bats to people and killing tens of thousands more people in West Africa as a result. And we've been looking at ways that you can manage these uh, diseases in wildlife populations in ways that are sustainable, that don't, for example, involve the extermination of entire species as a way of containing the threat, but that involve other policy and science-based, evidence-based ways of approaching these risks. And we've been talking about the risk of pandemic, um, and in particular, the risk of diseases migrating from bats to people um, for many years now, um, and raising the flag of concern about that relationship between um, wildlife and people, um, and how in an unmanaged way that poses enormous risks to us. And COVID-19 um, has had a devastating impact, as I said earlier, on so many people, but there are even worse pathogens that can be carried by bats. There are even worse zoonotic diseases that are awaiting around the corner if we don't get a grip on this relationship between wildlife and people. There is a second element that seems highly likely as a cause of COVID-19's pandemic, and that is the illegal wildlife trade. So at the moment, we don't know for certain what caused this pandemic. However, it seems highly likely that the presence um, of mammals that were infected in wet markets um, in Southeast Asia uh, were a significant contributory factor. They may even have been the cause themselves with people alongside those mammals and the migration of the disease from the one to the other. That is not right. What is the answer then? Is it to shut those wet markets? Well, actually, it's a bit of a societal rethink about that relationship between humans and wildlife. It's a rethink about the seriousness with which we do planning for dealing with zoonotic disease when it migrates into people, but also it's about the research that we do in zoonotic disease while they're in the wildlife populations. That's research that ZSL is absolutely at the heart of and that we want to apply even more vigorously and in a more targeted way um, to ensure that there is not going to be a COVID-20 or a COVID-21 or another Ebola or other um, massive pandemic coming from bats or other wildlife species and that we are prepared for such threats in the future far better than we've been in the past. So as I look at the impact of COVID-19, I look at it as something that uh, we wouldn't wish on anybody, something that is uh, deeply, deeply um, tragic for those who are directly involved, something that has now caused a systemic threat to the global economy with lockdown, and also something that can be addressed, can be um, prevented, happening again. So as I look at the future right now, as the Director General of the Zoological Society of London, I see ZSL being able to play a really important role in three different ways. Um, the first is I live in a country, a society that is just desperate to get out from under lockdown. The easing of lockdown, as I record this, has begun in the United Kingdom. And our two zoos, London and Whipsnade zoos, offer outside experiences with social distancing very possible and with highly visible ways of ensuring that the whole experience is COVID secure for individuals, for families, for people to go and enjoy engaging with nature again and enjoy getting outside and getting out of their homes after so many months of lockdown. That's a really important contribution to the future and the future well-being, mental well-being of people within our society. A second area 
is working on the illegal wildlife trade. So we believe very clearly that the illegal wildlife trade had a role in causing the COVID-19 pandemic and stopping that trade, intervening to prevent the smuggling of animals, the slaughtering of wildlife um, is one of the key areas that we work on in the UK and around the world. So you may not know this, but London Zoo at the moment, its entire coral collection, for example, comes from coral that has been intercepted at Heathrow Airport by the Revenue and Customs, and we've been asked to take it on. We recently were asked if we would accept some Chinese giant salamanders, and they become giant, uh, nearly two meters long when they are mature, but these ones were small ones. They'd been smuggled into the United Kingdom in a cornflake, cornflake packet, incredibly enough, and they were there for the illegal pet trade. And so again, we were asked if we would take these on. But the illegal wildlife trade is about more than smuggling into Heathrow Airport and London Zoo being asked to take on uh, the animals that, uh, that are being smuggled. It's about the industrial mass scale slaughter of wildlife. It really is at an industrial scale. And it's part of that relationship um, that has just gone so badly wrong that may also have been a contributory factor um, in those wet markets in Southeast Asia to COVID-19 spreading. So we believe that we are part of the future in addressing that illegal wildlife trade and stopping it. And then finally, I see ZSL as part of the future through our research on zoonotic disease in preventing the next COVID-19 pandemic. This has been devastating for each of us individually, for our organisations and for the world. And none of us want this to happen again. ZSL can be part of making sure that it doesn't. But we can only do that if we survive financially. And ZSL has been enormously badly hit financially by the pandemic. About 95% of the money that we can choose where we invest it for ZSL comes through our takings from our two zoos. Uh, from March until June, our two zoos were completely shut, the longest time ever in our history. Well, we've reopened now in June 2020, but with social distancing, um, we are reopening in a very limited way and we know that we will make massive losses during the course of this year. We're looking at losses of over 20 million pounds as ZSL. And that threatens our viability as an organization. We entered the pandemic with no debt and decent reserves, and we will be massively indebted as we survive during this year. It's about survival. And so for us, that puts our zoos at risk. It puts the scientific research we do on zoonotic diseases, on the wildlife health management at risk, and it puts the conservation that we do in the UK and around the world at risk. And so for me, as the Director General of ZSL and for my organisation, the future is going to be all about trying to get some financial stability. We are enormously grateful to Sir David Attenborough for heading an appeal that we have launched to bring in funding for ZSL and to help us stay open. And we hope that uh, both individuals in the United Kingdom and elsewhere who see that appeal, but also institutions, organisations, companies and businesses like yours um, will be supportive of us because we desperately need that funding. So I asked myself the question, has everything changed as a result of COVID-19? And the answer is, I really hope so, because we just can't continue as individuals or as societies going on the way we've been going. At a very personal level, I've learned to do meetings online in a way that I've never been able to do before. I've hardly printed anything, so I've cut down far fewer trees and through my office-based activities. And my personal carbon footprint has really gone down. As we emerge from COVID-19, I'm not going to do the traveling that I used to do. I'm looking forward to having a much more carbon neutral working life. 
I think we as societies have re-evaluated the role in our society of the central workers. In the United Kingdom, the National Health Service, the NHS, and all its staff has absolutely come to the fore. We've also all realised the critical role of teachers and how challenging, as we all do our own homeschooling of our own kids, how challenging those roles can be. These are important aspects of experiences from the pandemic and lockdown that we must reflect on and keep um, keep reflecting on and change the ways in which we operate in our society in future. There's been a disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on some of the more disadvantaged parts of our societies, some of the poorest. We've also seen the in the United Kingdom, the BAME communities um, disproportionately affected by COVID-19. And we need to understand the root causes of that and to take action. And that coincides with some very clear rallying calls across many of our societies around the world and that have come from the Black Lives Matter movement. And we must listen to those. So yes, COVID-19 is a period of change and it needs to be a period of permanent change. And most of all, given the roots of COVID-19 in pandemic, uh, in zoonotic disease and the illegal wildlife trade, um, there needs to be a change in our relationship with nature and our relationship, indeed, with wildlife itself. And that's why as I look at the role of the Zoological Society of London and of how we engage with people, I see this as an opportunity to rethink the impact that we have to rethink the impact we have through the education we do, through the 150,000 school children who come for curriculum-based activity to ZSLs, to zoos, Whipsnade and London Zoo, to rethink the impact that we have through our online training of wildlife healthcare professionals around the world, of the masters and PhD students um, that we train um, at our sites in the UK um, and elsewhere, of the way in which we engage on conservation around the world. We need to reflect on what we've learned from COVID-19. We need to understand the opportunity to influence policy and to influence people's behaviours. And we need to do this in coalition. So we can only create change if we work together. If we avoid individual or simply national responses, but actually come together as a global community, as global business, as voters, as people who really care in our societies. And if we work together to understand what got us to the COVID-19 pandemic and to understand what needs to change, what lies in our hands for the future. Change is not optional, it's obligatory, it's a requirement. Our world is changing around us and so for us, the opportunity is to make this out of the tragedy, the individual tragedies of COVID-19, to make this a change for the better, so that not only are we ready to combat the next pandemic, not only are we intervening to prevent the next pandemic, but some of the other changes, some of the other issues that have emerged in our world around nature, around disadvantage, around poverty are changes that we address actively. We don't wait for the change to be thrust upon us, but we become masters of our own fate. I really hope that the Zoological Society of London can be a catalyst for those kinds of positive changes, but we can only do that if we survive financially. And so that's where I would ask for your help please do support us financially so that we are able to get through this pandemic crisis and contribute to creating positive change for the future.